Have fun. Excuse me, I should have had this open to the right spot. Genesis has been great, hasn't it? It's been a challenge. It's been a lot of really intense passages, right? It's been good. This week, I want to tell you something about something. I faced something potentially devastating. Something potentially devastating. Monday afternoon, I was, uh, I was in the gym with a, a member of the church, and we were working out together, and we were doing just a, like a normal squat movement, right? Getting the quads going. And I was setting up for my, my last set, and I got two reps in. At the bottom of the second rep, something happened. Something happened. I felt this tightness just break. So I panicked a little. I stood up, and I stood there, and I was like, oh, no. And, and my friend, who's an experienced lifter, like, knows what can happen sometimes, right? Like, did you pull something? Did you tear a muscle? I don't know if you're, like, sick like I am, but you see like a muscle tear on the internet like a video, and it's like the most devastating thing. You could watch it, right? If that were to happen, it would require significant surgery and physical therapy. Well, I'm standing before you today walking, which means that that didn't happen. That's not what happened. The circumstances weren't that bad, but they might be embarrassing. When I went down, it felt like my shorts just opened up. So when I got up, I'm thinking, oh no, if that's what's happened, I got to get out of here. How am I going to get out of here? Do I call Gabby? What am I supposed to do? Well, mercifully, it wasn't that bad. My shorts were intact. Okay? I just... (laughs) I just couldn't say the same about my boxers. Which had absolutely exploded at the seams. And were only destined for the garbage. I was really, really grateful that the circumstances de-escalated, right? We went from something that could have potentially been devastating to something simply embarrassing to something that's just comical. We can only hope for circumstances in life to de-escalate like that, right? To go from bad to good. But I imagine more often, that's not how things go. They actually do the exact opposite. That they go from good to bad to worse. This morning we see in our text a a set of three circumstances. God's activity in them and man's response to him. And I think this morning that this text gives us a lot of hope for every circumstance we face in this life. So I want to invite you to open up to uh, Genesis chapter 21. I'm going to invite Ron Rabideau to come up. He's going to read. Go to Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 21. Our text this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Genesis, chapter 21. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. 
Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray and ask the Spirit's assistance. Merciful Lord, Spirit of God, open our eyes, our minds, and our hearts that we may behold Christ in this word and walk away from this place strengthened, encouraged, challenged, and more like Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. If you remember back in chapter 18, who remembers chapter 18 at this point? Back in chapter 18, uh, the Lord came and, and visited Abraham and Sarah and said that he would return uh, a year later and that Sarah would have a child. Now, Sarah, if you remember, is, is eavesdropping on this conversation. And she, she laughs to herself. And she said, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? Right? No one eavesdrops on the Lord without him knowing. And so he, he, he's listening. She's like, who, did you laugh? Did Sarah laugh? She's like, no, 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 no. She denied it. I did not laugh. And he said, no, but you did laugh. Right? Remember that? But it was quite reasonable. Right? It's quite reasonable for her to laugh. These were laughable circumstances, right? Sarah is 90 years old. Abraham is 100. And for the last 10 chapters, right, that's, we've heard this fact several times over and over and over again. In fact, that Sarah is infertile is the second thing we learn about her in chapter 10. But Genesis has not been merely about a nomadic tribe of people with an infertile matriarch. 
Genesis has been about God's faithfulness to his promises in the face of laughable circumstances. And the key promise for the last 10 chapters, for however many, 25 years or something like that it's been, for them, the number one promise they've received is, you will have a son. And so we read in these opening verses, the Lord visited Sarah just as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. We're finally here. You guys, yeah, we've all been hearing it week after week after week. I didn't count how many weeks it's been for us, but, right, but it's been decades for them. And the moment is here. Isaac is born. The Lord has done exactly what he said he would do. He came to an infertile wife and her old husband, overcame menopause, and granted a miraculous child. The Lord visited Sarah just as he said he would and did what he had promised. Guess who's laughing now? Sarah is. We read it, Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. She has been granted to laugh in praise of what God has done. The faithfulness of God in these laughable circumstances is astounding. And there's something of a redemptive reversal occurring here, right? She laughed because of how laughable it was that her and Abraham could ever have children. But now, the one who laughed in disbelief laughs in praise, along with other people who laugh with her because she has been given a son whose name means laughter, right? This is just a straight-up reversal, a straight-up reversal of what's happened. So she's laughing in praise now with a son whose name means laughter. I wonder what, what you're laughing about in life these days. And I don't mean like, ha-ha, the office funny. I mean, what should you be expecting from God because he's promised it, but you're laughing because it seems impossible? I think maybe sometimes, whether explicitly or implicitly, one common way we do this is when we think about our unbelieving friends, neighbors, family members, and we're like, yeah, huh, okay, good luck with that one, right? And yet, Isaac's birth is miraculous. It's a miraculous birth. It's a type, really, of the spiritual birth that every Christian goes through when we first cry out in faith to God. Isaac's birth was beyond human ability. It was dependent on God to cause. So it is with our rebirths into the kingdom of God. So whatever might make you laugh in disbelief that God could save someone like that, right? Should just cause you to remember how laughable it was that God could save someone like us. Even as I think about myself, like who I was before Jesus, like the sort of condition of my life, but how God overcame all of that and saved me. Wherever you come from, he overcame all of that and saved you. Or maybe you know somebody who's struggling with addiction to substances or pornography use. Maybe you're walking with a husband or a wife who thinks that their spouse could ever change is laughable. Maybe you're the one laughing in disbelief that God could make any difference in your own life. 
Friends, let's stop laughing and start believing so that if God chooses to overcome these laughable circumstances, we can laugh in belief and praise because God does what he promises to do. Friends, in laughable circumstances, the Lord is faithful to fulfill his promises. God can and does overcome laughable circumstances. He did it with Sarah. He does it with each of us. Sometimes circumstances aren't so happy. We also see that the Lord works through difficult and displeasing circumstances. We continue to read, read verse 8. And the child grew up and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom he had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son At this point, we flashed forward a little bit. We flashed forward. They're throwing a a party to celebrate uh, celebrate Isaac's weaning. And according to some sources, uh, this probably would have been about three years later. It would have been a three-year process before you weaned a child. And we're here at this family affair. i got to stop doing that. We're here at this family affair. And something Something happens. There's an, there's an incident. It says that Ishmael laughed and Sarah noticed. Ishmael laughed at Sarah and Sarah demanded that Abraham kick Hagar and Ishmael out of the house. Right, we might think this is like an over, an over, overreaction, Right? Like, are we blowing this out of proportion? It kind of reminded me of uh, the scene in Goodfellas with Joe Pesci and Ray Liotta, and they're laughing, right? And he says, man, Ray Liotta's like, you are so funny. And he's like, funny, huh? Funny, like like a clown funny? Am I a joke to you? She's like, whoa, (laughs) settle down. You get the sense of the scene, right? It's very unsettling. Like, Joe Pesci could just do anything. But in this, isn't this an overreaction, but we realize and recognize that it's not. That Ishmael's laughter primarily was mocking. The Hebrew word for laughter comes in various forms, and this is one of the most intense ones. And it's meant to denote that Ishmael is mocking in his laughter. And it caused Sarah to realize something. So long as Ishmael is here, Isaac's position in the house is threatened. So he and his mother have got to go. These are very displeasing circumstances for Abraham, right? Ishmael is his son, right? He's watched him, he's watched him grow up. Ishmael's like 16 or 17 at this point. And I mean, too, given the circumstances, like, could you imagine kicking out your teenager just because they were being a jerk? <laughs> like, no, like, of course not. Right? Can't we just figure this out and work through this as a family? We go on in verse 12. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also. Because he is your offspring. God stepped in, spoke up, and affirmed Sarah's request. And in this, the Lord was being faithful to the promises that he made to Abraham. Whatever the Lord was going to do, he was going to do it through Abraham, and he was going to do it through promise and not through human effort, apart from promise. 
right? If you remember, Ishmael's conception and birth were problematic to begin with. It was an effort in trying to force the promise, to kickstart the plan, to make it work, make it happen. When the Lord affirmed Sarah's request, he did it because he was protecting the promises that Abraham's offspring would come through Isaac, the child of promise. The Lord is protecting his promises, protecting it, protecting them. This is highly instructive for us. Because I think our natural, natural fleshly tendency is to get things done for God rather than participating by faith in the things that he's already doing. Right, the Christian life, the li- our lives is, is a battle of the spirit and the flesh. And this is Paul's point in the fourth chapter of Galatians. When he references this incident and he applies this text to his audience because the Galatian Christians, if you're not familiar with Galatians, there was false teachers that came into their midst and they were like, ah, yes, faith in Jesus. Oh, certainly, we would not say otherwise, but also faithfulness to the law of Moses. Yes, yes, faith in Jesus, but also faithfulness. Paul interprets in that passage, he interprets Hagar, Sarah, and their offspring allegorically. That might put us on our heels like a little bit. Allegorically. No, no, no. Literal only. Well, allegory is often very literal and certainly based in the literal meaning of the text. If you'd like to know more about allegorical teaching, you could find me after church. I love talking about it. Right? But Paul, he interprets this passage allegorically. He says, Hagar corresponds to the works of the law to accomplish God's purposes, while Sarah represents the works of the Spirit in accomplishing God's purposes through promise. Hagar's children are slaves to the law, while Sarah's children are free according to promise. What Sarah realized is that their previous fleshly efforts to make God's promises happen were a threat to God accomplishing his purposes through promise. This request of hers is nothing short than faith in God. That she would no longer rely on her own work, but trust in the promise. Which is why she says, cast out this slave woman with her son, For the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And this is exactly what we're called to in Galatians 4. Really what this passage teaches us as well. Cast out reliance on good works in order to be made right with God and live according to faith. Now we are called to good works. Good works, though, come sort of after the fact, after the accomplishing. But we might fall into this mentality that our our good works sort of gain us something before God. I think we might do this explicitly, but I think often we do it implicitly, right? Might gain us something, a little bit of brownie points before the Lord. Or if you're anything like me, your failure to do good works makes you think that God's just probably had it up to here with you. Thinking about our works in this way is a recipe for more displeasing circumstances in our life. Right? Surely Abraham in this moment could have said, Oh, Lord, but wait, 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 wait. What if we keep Isaac or uh, Ishmael? What if we keep him around? Like, what if something happens to Isaac? What if he, like, dies? Like, at least we still got, like, a backup, right? We haven't made it to chapter 22 yet. For those of you who know, if you know, you know, right? If something happens, 
Can we keep Ishmael? Just in case. But Abraham needed to be set free from reliance upon the works he did so that he could embrace the promises of God by faith. And friends, right, he he makes a promise. He says, through your offspring, I'm going to bless the nations. Through your offspring. He has Isaac, but we know that Isaac's not the end of the story because Isaac eventually dies. Isaac does give birth to more children. We know that all of the promises made to Abraham to which Isaac points are fulfilled in no one other than Jesus Christ, who Paul in Galatians 3 calls him the offspring of Abraham. In him, all the promises of God are fulfilled. In him, all the promises of God are fulfilled. And faith in him is simply embracing Christ's work in saving us from our sin. Faith says, I have nothing to offer God. And we see that faith is the means by which God protects his promises from foolish notions of human usefulness. And I think Something that illustrates this well, because it sounds like a radical statement, right? Like, well, I want to be useful to God, don't I? It's a good desire. I'm not trying to shut that down, right? With this, no, 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 I I must be. I must be useful to the Lord. C.S. Lewis, uh, in this great little book that he wrote, uh, The Great Divorce, um, is having a, he's a main character in it, and he's having a conversation with a dead person who insists on uh, his good works and his usefulness to God, right? He's like, I must, no, 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 I will not go to heaven unless I must be useful there. I have to be useful. Only then will I go if I can be useful. Lewis says the promises of God will have nothing to do with this. He wrote, no, I could promise no sphere of usefulness. You are not needed there at all. No scope of your talents. Only forgiveness for having perverted them. No atmosphere of inquiry. For I will bring you to the land not of questions, but of answers. And you shall see the face of God. Isn't that radical? Isn't that radical just as we think about our relationship with the Lord and our natural tendencies to want to be useful. And God's like, no, 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 no. Here's the deal. I don't need you at all. But I love you. I like you. And I want you to be with me. Set aside, when it comes to your relationship with the Lord, notions of usefulness. And embrace the uselessness of faith. And trust that God protects his promises when you simply cling to him in faith. It's only then, I think, we'll be useful in God's hands. And that is what Abraham sees. He sees God protecting his promises. So he lets go. Let's go of his efforts. He gets up early in the morning, obeying Sarah's word, obeying the the Lord's word. And he packs up Hagar and Ishmael, and he sends them on their way. Are you in displeasing circumstances this morning? Are you trying to sort of make it work? In your life, friends, put away your fleshly efforts. Trust that the Lord is faithful to the one who trusts him. He will protect you and his promises to you, even in displeasing circumstances. Because in displeasing circumstances, the Lord is faithful to protect his promises.
But Hagar and Ishmael are out. So what about them? What's protecting them right now? They left the safety of Abraham's house. They've wandered into the wilderness of Beersheba. And too, it seems as though they've gotten lost, are in a desolate place, and they've run out of supplies. We see that Hagar lays Ishmael under a bush. It says that she goes a bow shot away. I, I, my head, I don't know. I've never, I don't shoot bows. Maybe somebody here shoots bows. They can let me know. But I imagine it's like, you know, like 100 yards, 100 yards away. In a desperation, she says, let me not look on the death of my child. And she sat opposite him. She lifted up her voice and wept. These are desperate circumstances. It doesn't get any worse than this. It seems as though there's nothing left to, to, nothing left to do but die. But in desperate circumstances, the Lord is faithful to answer our distress because of his promises. We read, and God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy, and hold him fast with your hand. For I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave it to the boy to drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Right? It's interesting. You'll notice, right? It says that she wept, but God heard the voice of the boy, not the voice of Hagar. I think what's happening here, given what we already know, this promise that the Lord made to Ishmael, that he would make him a great nation, that God would make him a great nation. So God is going to be faithful to hear the of his He's going to be faithful to hear because of his promises to Ishmael. When God makes a promise to his people, he promises to hear them in their distressing cries. So he responds, he says, fear not. Go, lift him up, take him up. You're going to be fine. Everything is going to be okay. In fact, look. Open your eyes. It says that he opened her eyes. And there's water. And they were able to take supply and be refreshed. And it said that God was with the boy. That he grew up. He did, did indeed became a nation. He lived. And what's amazing here. Right? We don't really know the condition of Hagar and Ishmael's soul. We just don't. In many ways, these promises that he's made to them are natural promises. And if God is faithful to hear the cry of the one to whom he's made natural promises, how much more does he hear the cry of the one to whom he's made supernatural ones? How much more faithful is he to hear your cry. The cry that you make out in faith when you are in distress. When you are in desperate circumstances. As the people of God, we're in a wilderness. The world in which we live, the one we're sojourning through, is said to be a wilderness. It's desperate. It's a distressing world. And, and granted, like we live in Comfy first world America. We don't have to suffer like our Coptic brothers and sisters do, being killed every day. Or Christians in the Congo. 
even just people in the world, right? We've got it good. We have our struggles. Even here, we deal with cancer, even just the stress of war, addiction, temptation. Loneliness. Brothers and sisters, Jesus overcame the wilderness in his life. You remember? When he went out into the wilderness, it wasn't just sort of like a nice thing that he was doing. He wasn't on a sort of like 40-day spirit-like quest. No, Jesus went into the wilderness to overcome it so that those who were in a wilderness might have safety and protection under him. Just as Hagar received water from a well, brothers and sisters, the Lord provides us sustenance from his word. Every week as we gather as a church, and we come together to worship God, we in some senses, you might imagine the world as a a wilderness, and it's desperate, and we're, we're, we're in distress often, right? Picture a desert, but every seven or six days journey is a building, And it says on the front of the building, embassy of the kingdom of God. Right, You're at your last leg. You've run out of supplies. But there it is, perfect timing for you to enter into. And in it, it's a well, the preaching of the word, and a meal, the Lord's Supper. New people are coming in all the time. And as you continue to progress, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you find yourself more and more satisfied, ready for every step back out into the wilderness. Because you know that the Lord is with you. He hears you. He satisfies your cries and your needs your desires. I don't know if you know Jesus this morning, but I can't imagine, or I suppose I can. Because we were all at one time wandering through that wilderness without a place to rest. But if you don't know Jesus, come to him in faith. Because in him, Even though this life is a wilderness, we find rest and life and hope and peace. We only need to embrace him by faith. If you are a Christian this morning and you know Jesus, one, I would say, That even though we're in cushy America and you step out of this building today, recognize you step into a wilderness and there's nothing you need more. Whether you're here or you're on vacation, there's nothing that you need more and there's nothing that you can anticipate more than the hope that you have at the end of that week again to come and receive sustenance as the people of God as we worship him together. Amen? Friends, we need it. We need God's word. These three circumstances offer snapshots of our lives. We praise God when he does what we think is laughable. We're challenged to trust when life is displeasing. And often when we are distressed as we live in a difficult world, we cry out to God. 
He responds. Friends, in these circumstances, the Lord is faithful to his promises. That's what this passage teaches us. That the Lord is faithful to his promises in every circumstance. So praise him, trust him, and cry out to him. Amen? And let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, merciful Lord, give us your grace and your mercy. Help us, we pray. We need you. Every hour, we need you. Guide us through this life, and all for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.